When two or more atoms combine, atoms or ions, I should say, combine, we start to form molecules and compounds. Okay, just like we represent atoms or elements by using their chemical symbols, so we don't have to write out big long words, we also represent compounds um, with something that we call a chemical formula. A chemical formula makes use of a couple of things. First of all, the chemical symbols for the various elements in the compound, as well as these things called subscripts. And subscripts are the little numbers written in the chemical formulas um, that tell us how many of each particular element is present. So symbols and subscripts together make up chemical formulas. Okay, we can take a look um, at a couple of these examples that will tell us, okay, what atoms, what elements do we have present in these compounds and how many of them? So for example, this first element here, sorry, this first compound here, H3PO4, the elements that we have present, if we take a look at our periodic table, um, the elements that we have present are hydrogen, that's the H, then we've got this P, and if we look that up, that's phosphorus, phosphorus is the one that has the symbol of P, and then O is oxygen. Those are the different elements that we have present in this compound. Now, how many of each of those do we have? That's indicated to us by the subscripts. So first of all, if we look at this number three here, the subscripts always um, apply to whichever element was written directly before it. So this three is telling me that we have three hydrogens. Now, Moving on, taking a look at phosphorus here, we can see there's no number written here. Whenever there's no number written, guys, we say that it means that there's one, only one. Anytime there's only one uh, of something, we don't write a subscript. Save yourself the time. Okay, so there's only one phosphorus. Lastly, our oxygens, we've got a four written here as a subscript. Um, so that means we have four oxygens straightforward hopefully. Um, if we take a look at another example here, let's talk about this one, K2Cr2O7. Um, what are we looking at here? Well first let's figure out what different elements we have present in this compound. So we have K is our first element listed and that is potassium. You can find it in group one in your periodic table. Then we have CR. So it's important to remember that when we're using atomic symbols uh, and they have more than one letter, the second letter would be lowercase. Okay, so it's only the first letter that's capitalized. That's very important to know um, so that when you see something like CR, one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, you recognize, oh, that's actually all one element. It's not an element called C and an element called R. Important to know that. So CR, if you find it somewhere in the middle of the periodic table, it's chromium. And then O, we've seen already, we know that's oxygen. So how many of each of these do we have? Well, we've got our two potassiums. We've got two pointing to the chromium. Okay, and then quite a few of these guys, we've got seven oxygens present. Okay, just to bounce around, keep you on your toes, let's do this example here, Al2, and then in brackets, SO4, close bracket, three. Weird. Okay, we'll deal with the numbers in a second. Let's figure out what particular elements we're talking about. So first one up, we've got AL, and you can find that in group 13 in your periodic table, that's aluminum. Then we've got this SO, that's both.
both in brackets. But again, because both those letters are capitalized, I'm talking about two different elements. Not an element with the symbol SO. I'm talking about one element with the symbol S, that's sulfur. And then our friend oxygen comes up again with a symbol O. How many of each do we have? Well, we've got this two showing us that there's two aluminums. Remember, it applies to the um, symbol written before it, written to the left of it. And then our SO4s, weird, okay? We've got this three outside the bracket. And let's shift gears to maybe a little bit of a math lesson. Even though I'm not a math teacher, I think this is called distributive properties. So it's important to know that this three applies to everything in the brackets, which means it applies to the O4, and it applies to the S. And remember, the, the S not having a subscript written next to it means that there's one. So basically what this um, stuff in the brackets and then the subscript three outside the brackets is telling us is that we've got three of everything in the brackets, everything in the parentheses, if you want to sound fancy. Okay, so this three times just one sulfur in the brackets means I've got three sulfurs and then I've got three of these O4. So what we'll need to do is multiply those two subscripts together three times four, which means I will have 12 oxygens. So those guys that have um, brackets and subscripts outside of the brackets, they can get a little bit chaotic. Um, just remember that the number outside of the brackets applies to everything inside the brackets, the exact same way it does in math. I'm not gonna do the other two examples, I think I did the hard ones here, but if you want to go ahead and do them, please feel free to do so. Couldn't hurt. But let's talk about molecular compounds first and foremost. So molecular compounds are made of two or more non-metals, okay? Which means, gang, that we are looking at only the right-hand side of the periodic table. So elements to the right, of the staircase are non-metals. Um, these molecular compounds are formed when something called a covalent bond, which happens when electrons are shared between two atoms. I'm just going to underline this key, two key words. So a covalent bond found in molecular compounds forms when electrons are shared between two atoms. Okay, when we talk ionic compounds, make sure you compare uh, this idea of how the bond is formed in a molecular compound versus how the bond is formed in an ionic compound. And molecular compounds we name using a system of prefixes. So what's happening here? Well, all of these numbers refer to subscripts. Okay, we've just talked about what a subscript is. So these numbers we'll see in chemical formulas written as subscripts um, indicating how many of a particular atom we have. That's in the chemical formula. When we go uh, and try to name these compounds, or when we're given the name, we're going to see these different prefixes before that are written before um, the element name in the compound. Okay? Let's go through some steps in how do we name our um, molecular compounds if we have the formula and then how do we write the formula if we have the name. We're going to do formulas first, looks like. So you're going to be given a name and be asked to write the formula. So first thing that you need to do is write the chemical formula for the first element in the name and then based on the prefix that was given in the name, you'll write a subscript for that element. Then, repeat steps one and two for the second element. So we're only ever looking at what we would call a binary compound, um, and that prefix by meaning two things. So two elements in the compound. That's all we're asking you guys to name at this level. So, got some examples here of some names, and we have to write the formula. The first compound 
the first compound that we're dealing with, dihydrogen monoxide. It's a scary one. It's a pretty scary compound. Um, dihydrogen monoxide, there's petitions on the internet um, calling for the banning of dihydrogen monoxide. It should be like a substance that we're not allowed to have. Um, it's kind of unsafe. For example, dihydrogen monoxide is involved in every single drowning, okay? In every single drowning, dihydrogen monoxide has been involved. Um, dihydrogen monoxide is a key component in lots of corrosive um, or poisonous uh, solutions. So like acids, dihydrogen monoxide, always every acid, okay? Um, lots of cleaners that you might have at home. There's dihydrogen monoxide in there, so it's, it's a pretty scary one. Let's write the formula for it. Okay, going through those steps. So first step says, look at the first word. Okay, it tells us what element is present. So we've got hydrogen. We're going to write that symbol down. And then this prefix here of di tells us how many hydrogens we have. So dihydrogen means we have two hydrogens. And remember we write the subscript um, to the bottom right of the um, element symbol, the chemical symbol. Next, we repeat those same two steps now for the second element in the name. So monoxide, we change the ending. We change the ending of the second element uh, in the name to end in I-D-E. So oxide, where did that come from? It came from oxygen, okay? So O. And then how many O's do we have? How many oxygens do we have? Well, we see this prefix mono, which means one. And when we have one as a prefix, we don't write anything. So the chemical formula for dihydrogen monoxide is H2O, which you guys might recognize as water. Oh, now you're sitting there thinking, water's not poisonous, it shouldn't be banned. Um, no, it shouldn't, but you can't find those petitions causing for the banning of dihydrogen monoxide. Now you guys know that that's fake science um, and not really accurate information, even though water is involved in every case of drowning. Um, that's not, it's not really a chemical we can, we can ban, is it? Okay, let's go through the rest of these. Let's move over here. Tetraphosphorus decaoxide. Don't have a meltdown at how long this name is. Let's break it down. It's, it's going to be really straightforward for you. So tetraphosphorus, that's our first one. Well, phosphorus, we've looked at that already. It's a P, okay? Also, I should say the nice thing about molecular compounds, writing formulas for them, is we're only looking at a very few... Um, different elements to get these uh, to get these chemical symbols okay so we only have to look at like I don't know a quarter of the periodic table makes it a little bit easy as long as you know where you're looking anyways I digress tetraphosphorus means we've got some phosphorus chemical symbol P and this prefix of tetra means that we have four phosphoruses Okay, next one, deca oxide. So again, we've seen oxide already. We know it comes from oxygen, which is an O. Okay, and that prefix deca, you can look back at the prefix chart. If you do enough practice, guys, you're going to have you're going to have a new way of counting to 10 completely memorized. Okay, but use your chart now until it starts to sink in. Deca is a prefix that means 10. So our formula here is P4O10. And look at how I write that, guys. Okay, so proper chemical symbols, which means I'm paying attention to, like, am I using uppercase or lowercase? Um, and it's written all together, so there's not big spaces between the different elements. Okay, that formatting is kind of significant. Uh, let's come down and do the example here. Carbon dioxide. Now, lots of you guys know this formula off the top of your head. So I'm going to go through it. You probably already have it written down. But let's talk about this. So our first element is carbon. Symbol is C. Now there's no prefix on this one because, fun fact, 
we don't put a prefix on the first element in the formula if there's only one of them. So if the prefix should be mono, meaning there's only one of the first element written in the formula, we don't write the prefix at all, okay? So we don't call it monocarbon dioxide, we just call it carbon, meaning one carbon, dioxide, and di is a prefix for two, we've already seen both of those, oxygen and di. Okay, last up, nitrogen trichloride. So again, we've got just the word nitrogen here, which has a chemical symbol of N. There's no prefix, so that means there's just one of them. We don't write mono for the first um, element in the chemical formula, so we're not gonna write it. Um, and we also don't write the subscript of one. So our work with nitrogen is done. Moving on, trichloride. So chloride comes from chlorine. I'm gonna write my formula, or sorry, my symbol for chlorine, which is Cl, and then Tri means I have three chlorides present. Okay, so that is going formula to name. It might interest you right now to just kind of pause this video, go through, do some practice questions of going um, name to formula. Okay, name to formula, get some practice in, then come back, watch the video, Go through the examples of formula to name, and then go do your practice questions on formula to name. When we are given the formula for a molecular compound and we have to write the name, we've got three steps to go through. First of all, look at the subscript on the first atom, write the proper pre prefix. We've just talked about this note. Um, if we have just one of the first atom, we don't use mono as a prefix, okay? Um, after we write the prefix down, we write the name of the first atom as all one word with the prefix, so there's no spaces. That's dealing with the first element. Then for the second element, we, rep we repeat steps one and two. We will always use a prefix on the second uh, element in the compound. Um, so we will always, even if it's mono, we'll include mono. And then we always change the ending um, of the name for the second atom to I-D-E. Okay, so it always changes, the second one only. All right, let's look at some examples here. So we've got PCL5. So step one, take a look at the first element. Okay, it's P, find that on your periodic table, and you'll see that that is phosphorus. Okay, we have only one phosphorus, so we don't write a prefix. We don't write mono, we just write phosphorus. Then, Cl5, so this subscript of five means we have a prefix of penta, and then Cl, is chlorine, and we just have to remember to change its ending to chloride. So this first guy is phosphorus pentachloride. Next up, I3, F7. Okay, so we look at our first one, that I3. Okay, we've got three iodines. How do we indicate that? Our prefix for three is tri, and then Iodine. Isn't that weird to have two eyes next to each other again? Okay, I don't think we see that in many words in the English language. But triiodine, or triodine, if you want to say it faster. And then F7. So prefix for seven is hecta. Okay, that's a two. And then F is fluorine, and we change its ending two i so fluoride it's a little messy but you get the gist heptafluoride so triiodine heptafluoride is our second one last s2 o6 okay so looking at the s2 we've got two sulfurs so our prefix for two is di and then sulfur and then o6 means 
six oxygens, so hexa oxide. There we go. Disulfur hexa oxide. Now we've gone name to formula, formula to name. Um, that's almost it for molecular compounds. Okay. Generally, in my experience, students find these fairly easy to name. There are a couple of wrenches thrown at you. Not like literal wrenches, that'd be rude. Okay. But just things that are a little bit more challenging. First of all, we've got molecular elements. So there are some elements in the periodic table that cannot and do not hang out by themselves. Okay, they always need to have a friend. And maybe in your own life, you know people who can't be alone. Okay, they always have to be dating someone. They always have to be hanging out with someone. Um, I know lots of people like that. So some elements are exactly the same. They either need to have friends in compounds or if they're found just on their own, for example, when we're talking about just oxygen, um, then they hang out with another atom, another oxygen atom, like an atom of its same kind. So for example, these guys that I have listed on the left here, there's seven of them. These guys are what we call diatomics, okay? That means they are found in two. So when we're talking about oxygen, for example, oxygen in the air we breathe, we're not talking about O, okay? We are talking about O2. Now, keep in mind, that's just when we're talking about oxygen as an element. It is always found as O2. Oxygen can be found on its own, like just one oxygen when it's in a compound. So if we think about water being H2O, we don't need to have a second O, and the O doesn't need to have another oxygen friend because it has hydrogen friends. So it's in the compound, um, it's, got, it's got its friends, I guess we could say, from the hydrogen, so it's not gonna be O2. So I don't want you thinking every time you see oxygen, it's always gonna be O2 regardless. No, when it's in a compound, you go with your regular rules for figuring out how many oxygens are in the compound. But when we are talking about just oxygen, necessarily for all life, we are talking about O2. Similarly, hydrogen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all these guys need to hang out in pairs as well. So when we are talking about any of these just as an element, they are always found as a diatomic. This is a fairly crucial piece of information. Highlight it, or star it, or whatever you're doing in your notes to draw your attention to it, okay? Those are found as diatomics. Then we have phosphorus and sulfur. Again, when we're talking about them just hanging out by themselves, they need a few more friends, okay? Um, they have really big issues around being alone. So phosphorus comes in fours. That's how many friends it needs. Imagine having four friends, wild. Sulfur needs even more, it needs eight, okay? I don't like to use the M word in my teaching um, very often. That's memorization, okay? Um, and it is my hope that you guys do enough examples that this is just ingrained in your brain and you don't ever have to think about it. However, until it gets to that point, yeah, we do have to do a bit of memorizing, okay? One thing I recommend is that you guys write this right on your periodic table. That way it's always there with you um, and it's always written down um, anytime you're doing any homework or practice questions or anything like that. You always have that info so you don't have to remember that oxygen's O2. You have it written right on your periodic table that oxygen is O2 when it's on its own. So molecular elements are one of the challenging parts of learning about molecular compounds. The other is the 
fact that lots of these molecular compounds have different or common names. We've already seen that with water. Nobody calls water dihydrogen monoxide. Nobody says that. People would look at you weird, okay? But that is, in fact, what its, like, proper um, name would be. We call it the IUPAC, I-U-P-A-C, which stands for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Nice to know, not neat to know. And basically, that's the organization that's making up all the rules for how we get to name our compounds, okay? So IUPAC rules would say water is actually called dihydrogen monoxide, but nobody says that. We say water, so we have to know these common names, okay? Same with glucose, sucrose, ammonia, hydrogen peroxide, kind of ozone too. Those all are common names, okay, for, um, for chemicals that we would name differently using IUPAC rules. And then methane and propane are organic names. And we don't talk about organic really um, until much further down the road in chemistry. So you guys will want to look up the formulas for all, well, I guess we have seven left now, all seven of these remaining compounds. And again, I do suggest that you put them on your periodic table um, so that you always have them with you, okay? Um, pay attention when you're doing practice problems. If something comes up um, with either um, it's a molecular element or it's something that has a common name, you have to be able to recognize that. That's why I suggest putting these formulas on your periodic table, okay? So you will need to make sure you're writing a common name um, when it's a substance that should have a common name. Please make sure you get lots of practice done. That is how we make things stick in our brains is by going through practice, checking over our work, and asking questions when we are unsure.